The Amiga, the uh, company called Amiga, was started in 1982 by myself and Dave Morse, the president. I was not part of it originally. It started uh, with a fellow named Larry Kaplan. Larry Kaplan was uh, one of the founders of uh, Activision. And he used to work uh, for me at Atari. And when he left Atari uh, to start Activision, I gave him a letter of recommendation that helped him start Activision. That was in 1979. And then about uh, 1982, Larry Kaplan called me up on the phone one day and said he was tired of uh, working at Activision. He wanted to start a new games company. And he asked if I knew anybody with money and lawyers and stuff. And I said, no, not personally, but my boss does. At this time, I was working for Zymos. And uh, Bert Braddock was uh, president of Zymos. And he knew these fellows from Texas that helped to start Zymos. And they had money. And uh, they were very interested in starting a video games company because at that time, it looked like video games were going to keep going up through the roof. Little did they know that the whole video games thing was going to turn around and go through the cellar in a year or two. But uh, anyway, so I, I introduced them together, uh, my friend Larry Kaplan and my boss, Bert Braddock. And together they came up with a business plan, and uh, they found this guy, uh, Dave Morse, to be president from back east. He was vice president of Tonka Toys, uh, in charge of marketing at Tonka Toys. They brought him out here, got him all situated in the house and everything. They had this business plan, they had the investors. They got an office, empty office in uh, Santa Clara. About that time, Larry Kaplan decided to quit. He got cold feet or something, or maybe things weren't happening fast enough for him. Or maybe he wasn't getting a big enough piece of the action, I don't know why. But he quit and left them with no engineer to make things go. Although Larry wasn't really an engineer, he was a programmer. They talk about programmers being engineers, but I still distinguish between the two. It started with the idea of a video game machine, and I was working at uh, Zymos for Burt Braddock, and they wanted me to design the chips so that Zymos could build the uh, chips, and Amiga could sell the games, and everybody would make money. That was the idea. But when uh, Larry Kaplan left, they needed some help, so they asked me if I would take over and be the uh, vice president of engineering of Amiga. And I said, sure, provided. Number one, we get to use the 68,000. And number two, I get to make it not only a gaming machine, but a computer. I had a lot of ideas for a computer that uh, Dave Morris and the investors seemed to like, even though they were primarily interested in a video game machine. As long as we could make it expandable and it didn't cost them much extra, they were willing to go along with it also being a computer. Okay, so uh, there we were, me and Dave Morse in an empty office, and a vague plan to make the best video games machine that was also a computer. I think that both Dave Morse and I both got our wish. We got the best video game machine, we also got the best computer. And I had visions of it being something that it's not yet, and that is something that really uh, competed with IBM and took a bite out of IBM. And I don't think that's the Amiga's fault, I think it's the fact that it hasn't been too competitive. I think that uh, Commodore was very uh, bad off financially, about 1983, 84, right in there. And uh, C64 sales were down, and uh, Commodore was having trouble with the banks, and uh, they didn't really advertise it well enough. And they didn't have the money for good software support, uh, good supported developers. They not only didn't have the money, they didn't have the experience and incentive for good software support. They were more of a games machine mentality than they were a computer mentality, and they weren't interested in competing with IBM like I was. So in that sense, it's not quite what I had expected. I had expected that we would be a business machine as well as a video machine. Of course, at the beginning, when the chips were done in 84, we had a lot of companies looking at us, but uh, nobody wanted to invest in a, a small computer company at that time, uh, especially a video games computer company, because video games had gone pew, down. I'm very glad to see that Commodore is working hard on new chips that are coming in the future. I was concerned about this because the uh, technology has gotten much better since we did the first Amiga chipset. We did those with the five micron design rules and now they've got one and one and a half micron design rules. You can put uh, five times as much on the same chip area. And uh, I was afraid that Commodore was not pursuing the new chip design well enough. But I've been reassured by uh, people that uh, they are coming out with new, uh, new mega chips that uh, will make it very competitive.
My vision is very negative there, so I don't know if you really want to hear it. My general feeling is that computers are doing more harm than good. Uh, I see the IRS is using computers extensively now to catch people on their taxes. If you're in the government, I suppose that's good. But you know, when they issued us our social security cards, they promised it would never be used for purposes of identification. In fact, my social security card has written on it, not to be used for identification. But now, look what happens. Pretty soon they'll have numbers tattooed on our forehead. And this is the only reason they can do this is because of computers. I see computers bringing closer and closer the day of the uh, Big Brother concept of uh, where government can control every aspect of your life because you're on the computer. One of the problems with computers is that uh, even the most of the people who they're, they're trying to teach computers to everybody and most people really have no need for them. It's a very expensive way to churn money in the society and to uh, people design computers so that other people can play with them and it looks to me like most of it is a great big waste. The whole technology thing, the result has been more and more crowding I don't think it's improved the average person's uh, lifestyle that much. Sure, I do better letters now. I have a word processor and I like my 2000. I play games on it, I do letters on it, I have my spreadsheets on it. But that isn't necessary. It isn't really necessary. And that's my feeling about computers, is they're not really necessary. Sure, you can design airplanes that go 100 miles per hour faster than you could without computers. But so what? The only people that are really still doing useful working jobs, I think, are the farmers and the doctors and uh, the people that make clothes, uh, the necessities. And beyond that, we don't really need it. Every household has more toys, more electronic gadgets than they really need. Oh, play the game. Learn programming. Learn to design computers because that's where the future is. I'm not saying it's not real. It's definitely real and it's definitely coming as a big thing and uh, it's going to further separate the classes though because the people that can't go to school at a level to learn computers are going to be tomorrow's uh, second class citizens and uh, it's going to further uh, make the rich richer and the poor poorer it doesn't bring society together, it separates I didn't tell you that I started a new job. People might be interested in the uh, fact that I'm now working at a small medical electronics company designing chips that go into pacemakers and what they call implantable defibrillators. Uh, defibrillator shocks the heart into working again if it fails. And uh, it goes inside the body and it charges a capacitor to a uh, big capacitor to about 750 volts. And if the person's heart stops beating, it goes whomp and delivers a shock. So that's why they call it an implantable defibrillator. And I'm doing chip design for that now. It's very interesting.